Thank you for listening to the Impact Leaders Podcast, featuring leaders in sustainable and impact investment, sharing their stories, experiences, and advice to increase awareness and highlight best practices in order to help us transition more capital into the industry faster. I am grateful that you're choosing to invest your time to listen to our guests, since I know that you're going to feel encouraged and inspired. I am JP Dalman, founder and CEO of ILM Partners, and we're the proud sponsors of the podcast. ILM Partners is an advisory and soon to launch multi-asset management firm targeting to acquire and scale investment funds focused on sustainability and impact one of the fastest growing areas of investment management globally, enabling investors to generate returns with confidence whilst having a net positive impact in the world. Our mission is to facilitate and accelerate the transition of 5 billion of capital to sustainable impact investing in the next five years. If you would like to explore the opportunity of working together, email contact at ilmpartners.com for an introductory and confidential conversation. Your support means everything to us since it's what really keeps us going. So make sure you share our work with someone that will benefit from it. Please remember to subscribe to get the notifications and check the notes from each episode. We hope you enjoy today's special conversation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Impact Leaders. I hope everyone is well, healthy, and protected, and that you're finding the inspiration and taking the actions to make the most of the opportunities this new world we're living in is providing to us. Today's episode of Impact Leaders is the third on our new series called The Sustainable Investment Dilemma, looking into how industry can help address the climate and social crisis, in particular, the financial industry taking on the opportunity to address the way it has funded the activities that have put us in our current situation. Uh, I invite you all to visit our website at ILA and Partners um, and also uh, look at our YouTube channel uh, to watch the first video interview on this important subject as part of the launch of this series. And uh, to continue with the series, our guest today is Tim Crockford. Hello, Tim. Hello. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. No, no, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I was just gonna double check. Where are you today, Tim? I'm uh, I'm sitting in my home office in London. Um, yeah, in the same room that I've been for most of the last twelve months now, and uh, and waiting for the moment that I can uh, I can be set free and let loose in the in the good old real world again. Very good, very good. Uh, I always like checking so that people, you know, uh, wherever they're listening to, they have an idea. It's been an interesting time, right? But, uh, you know, good and bad of the lockdown and, and, and COVID, but we'll, we may mention some of that. So as an introduction, team, uh, let me share with the audience a short um, version of your bio uh, for, for their benefit, um, and especially if they meet you for the first time. Uh, Tim uh, Crockford is a senior fund manager and leads the Regnant Equity Impact Solutions team, uh, having joined J.O. Hambro Capital Management in 2020 from Hermes Investment Management. He previously managed the Hermes Impact Opportunities Equity Fund from its launch in December 2017, having co-founded the Hermes Impact team in 2016. Tim joined Hermes in 2009 as a research analyst for the European Equities team and became lead portfolio manager of the ESG integrated Hermes Europe X UK equity fund in 2015, which he also managed until he moved to lead uh, the Regnant Equity Impact Solutions team. Uh, ni nice and simple, I think. <laughs> Good. Um, so, Tim, as it is our tradition, you know, the first question we ask uh, our guests is, you know, what is uh, sustainable and impact investing? Ooh, broad question. So, you know, I think the, 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 the short answer is investing that takes into account that as the world grows, as the population grows, the old way of doing things uh, needs to change to become more sustainable. So in its simplest form, when you talk about sustainable investing, all you're talking about is changing our systems of productive growth, moving away from those that, uh, that are unsustainable towards systems that are much more sustainable as we grow. 
Um, of course, when it comes to impact uh, and sustainable investing as specific asset strategies, uh, then of course you can get more specific with def with definitions. And I think, you know, one of the big challenges that the industry as a whole faces as this part of the industry, uh, as this part of the financial services industry grows, uh, is the challenge of, well, on one hand classification and possibly on the other hand, misclassification. So I think uh, it is very important uh, within the broader area of responsible investment to be very specific about uh, not just what you're calling the strategy you, that you run, but also what you're trying to achieve, uh, both in terms of your impact goals, uh, as well as, of course, your, your financial return goals. Um, so, you know, when it comes to impact investing specifically, you know, that, of course, is a separate niche within the broader responsible investment context. Uh, and of course, then we very much look towards the, uh, the global impact investing network definition, uh, whereby ultimately uh, impact investing is all about invent investing with the intention to generate a measurable uh, positive impact uh, to either an economic, sorry, an environmental uh, mm -hmm. target or towards, of course, a, a social one. Uh, yes, very interesting. And I like, and I will talk uh, to people about your website, but I do recommend people to already go to it because you have a very interesting quote there as well about, you know, creating these market-based solutions, you know, for making the world a better place. Um, uh, and you do mention the environment and society. Uh, and from that perspective, actually, last night I was on a call and somebody asked me, you know, so what, what does, you know, how would do we define impact, right? And I started going on about, as I learn more and more, and as I observe, you know, how the world behaves and the different, uh, and we'll talk about the spectrum as well, the different parts of impact. But this part about, is, is it society or is it environment? You know, first, or what is impact? Do you have any 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 other kind of maybe personal thoughts that you have developed over the years? I think you know it's it's we we, we work in an industry that wants to classify things you know to the uh, uh, to the furthest possible de degree, and I think it's it's natural to sort of talk about you know impact against as you've alluded to the context of what the the, the targets uh, or the outcomes you're looking to achieve are, and and you know what sort of outcomes, whether they're uh, aiming for a better planet or whether they're uh, aiming for a better society. Um, ultimately, the two are, of course, hugely interrelated and interlinked and, uh, you know, separating, um, you know, people and planets, it makes it, uh, you know, is arguably is, is a false separation because mm -hmm. ultimately, um, you know, there is, there is no one without the other. Um, you know, so I think the, 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 the idea of what impact investing is to us is really trying to find um, companies that can, you know, th through the solutions they sell, through the products and services that they sell, um, offer a better way of doing something. As I sort of said in the, to your first question, it's all about trying to solve a problem to do the same thing that you've always done uh, in a better way. You know, whether that's getting around, you know, getting from A to B, you know, using a zero emissions vehicle as opposed to using uh, a comb combustion engine vehicle, or whether that's generating power through, uh, uh, through renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels, or indeed whether that's, you know, using new modalities of, uh, uh, you know, of, of healthcare treatment, such as the ones we've seen uh, launched over the last 12 months to combat uh, the current uh, global pandemic that we face. Um, you know, which news, new, which news, uh, newer and and uh, uh, more innovative modalities than uh, than you know, previous vaccines. So ultimately, it's about it, what it really comes down to is about offering better solutions uh, to achieve something in you know in, in a more sustainable way. Yes, yes, and um, yes, and it's, it's interesting because I, I'm completely honest. Um, um, I've spoken to a few, you know, people by now, right, on on the podcast. But um, yeah, I don't think anyone has actually sp spoken about it in terms of, you know, the evolution and improvement, and on that way. So I like that in terms of, you know, uh, because even and again to mention some examples. So I think it was last week that HSBC um, announced that uh, you know they're committing to stop lending you know to to coal mines and and other similar uh, uh, industries but what i try to explain to people is that you know, it, it takes time uh, to actually do that 
I think that's that's a, that kind of the long term example of you know product evolving and the company evolving. But yeah. that would be actually our kind of longest time, longest term example of this concept of you know it takes you know you have to improve what you're doing and change it and change the model. And, I, and obviously we have had conversations over the over the years now about that from the first time that we spoke, right? Yes, and I think you. That, that, I think one of the things as well you're sort of alluding to is that, it, you know, I think we it's human nature perhaps to try and think about things as you know absolute good and absolute bad. We want to classify things as to this is desirable, this is undesirable, but the truth of the systems that we that you know operate with every day. Uh, whether that's you know as you're alluding to to get our to get our materials the materials that we require to manufacture the goods and services we consume uh, whether that's to feed ourselves whether that's to treat healthcare ailments um, or whether that's to power our homes these these systems are very complex interconnected systems uh, and there is no there's no such thing as you know absolute good and absolute bad everything, every action, every economic activity has both positive impacts and negative impacts. Well, most have both positive and negative. I, I guess you could argue there are some uh, activities which are purely uh, negative, but rarely have I, at least in my experience, I've never come across um, you know, a solution that doesn't have um, drawbacks, that doesn't have uh, disadvantages. And so I think, you know, for example, if you're looking at moving from um, you know, a world whereby everyone's using uh, combustion engine vehicles to battery electric vehicles well guess what battery electric vehicles are pretty heavy uh, and therefore they're riding on rubber tires and you know which are which are formulated from fossil fuels uh, and therefore tire wear is higher so actually the emissions from the tires themselves are actually higher uh, if you're talking about transitioning towards um, you know a, a hydrogen economy which of course is going to be a really good solution for some heavy industrial industries which badly need to decarbonize. Of course, that in itself, again, is going to come with other negative impacts. So for example, hydrogen uh, draws and requires huge amounts of pure water uh, in order for hydro, uh, hydrogen elect electrolysis to function. You know, so the, the way we look at the world and the way Regnan as a business thinks of things is in terms of the sustainability, not of siloed products and services but of systems and the functioning of those systems and the interlinkages of those systems um, you know so when we think about impact and positive impacts and negative impacts what we're trying to do is ask ourselves you know this is the incumbent way of achieving you know transportation power generation uh you know cement production today what are the better ways that what are the better solutions that exist to do that and what are the new unintentional impacts that are going to be generated from a transition towards that better way um you know so i think it's it's you know to people who are perhaps new to the world of impact investing and and the broader responsible investment space um i think there's almost a process that you have to go through uh, which you've kind of alluded to where it starts off with okay how can we avoid harm uh, how can we avoid these harmful activities but then it sort of evolves to thinking of better ways of doing things, um, and of course, mm. as you've, as you rightly pointed out in your uh, kind introduction, I've been uh, I'm doing this for a while now, uh, you know. So uh, over the years, I've been able to sort of you know learn and, and change my focus uh, as to uh, as to how uh, myself and and now the team that that I'm uh, uh, leading up um, think about impacts in this broader context. So uh, yes, yes, and, and so in this context, you know. It's very evident, you know, this point that I make about, you know, the question, are we facing the sustainable investment dilemma? You know, can we, um, you know, can we invest in a way that we can help, you know, with the solutions and we can help with effectively, you know, as grand as it sounds, you know, saving the world? <laughs> um, or would... financing of saving the world, if that's yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, look, I, I think I, I, I would personally, I wouldn't phrase it like that because you know, while of course we are contributing to it towards it, as you said, just said, it's it's financing the people who are changing the world, uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to you know actively directly changing it. But of course, that's very important. Um, and and apart from capital allocation, or, or perhaps with capital allocation, does come a responsibility to try and direct. And I think. You know that that's an area where a, where a big part of impact investing, particularly in the in the private uh, in the sorry in the public equity space, 
uh, that the team and I um, uh, operate in, you know, engagement with companies, with management teams of businesses is key, not so much to try and, you know, change their mission. You know, I think when it comes to the business's mission and what they exist, you know, what problem that business exists to solve, you know, that's something which is either there or, or it isn't, um, you know, that the business has to have been formed um, or evolved to have a specific mission at its heart uh, to solve a particular problem. However, as we've touched upon, there are always going to be um, incidental negative impacts that emerge from any activity, no matter how good the mission uh, might be. So I think that's where impact investors and you know, people allocating capital towards um, sustainable investment can make a, an additional difference and have an additional impact it's through their engagement and through their ability to help perhaps management teams mitigate some of the uh, uh, some of the challenges and risks that they uh, that that they create. Mm. Yes, and we will come back to that. Actually, uh, I want to talk about global equities. Uh, I'll try to remember and link it between impact, you know, classification, impact, uh, uh, global equities, and this part about engagement and the change. Uh, so. Uh, for those that are listening, we're coming back to that. And um, so let me um, talk a little bit about your company, you know, so that people also learn uh, about your organization. Uh, and I will basically just to, to signpost, I'm gonna talk about Regnan, I'm going to talk about uh, J.O. Hambro Capital Management, and I'm also going to mention Pendel Group uh, for those that do not know about the structure and how the organizations you know, are all linked together. But uh, introducing uh, Regnan, uh, you know, a, a responsible investment a pioneer, uh, as they mentioned on the website. And their website, uh, if I am correct, is Regnan. So that's R-E-G-N-A-N dash J-O-H-C-M dot com. Is that correct? That's that's the European website, yes. At the European uh, website, it's perfect. Regnum um, website for the, uh, the Australian business, which is where it, it sort of uh, grew out of. But yeah, well, I'll get to that okay. connection in, in, in okay, a minute. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and, and, and I like the slogan. So the, the slogan, uh, if you go to the website, you'll see, uh, and there's a, a couple of really nice videos as well, which I enjoyed, uh, which is, uh, the future belongs to everyone. Um, uh, and as I pointed out there, you know, finance has grown, it has come to, to play a more decisive role in shaping the world. Uh, capital flows have a, an impact across society and the environment, which you know we were just mentioning in terms of financing. Um, and kind of this, uh, uh, I like it was reverberate uh, through other parts of investor portfolios over time and share, shape uh, future opportunities. And you mentioned this as well, which is you know where I previously seen an externality, uh, this third axis is now an intrinsic as risk and return, you know. So um, I was gonna say as well, so I like this part which it says, Regnan started life to help investors achieve a strong three-dimensional returns and to invest in ways that make a difference to the world beyond their portfolios. Uh, uh, and they continue to work in research, engagement and advisory services, where, which are understand a bit like your three uh, areas or pillars. Uh, by moving into sustainable and impact investing. Uh, you know, they have begun this new chapter uh, as a mission-driven responsible investment manager, uh, moving from responsible um, investment influencer to a mission-driven responsible investment manager. Uh, and I can, you know, talk a lot about that, but I'll just mention very quickly, you know, that the roots uh, go back to a Monash University in Melbourne in 1996. Uh, as of you know the, the regnan um and then now uh with 2020 marking a new chapter in the in the story um you know as they move into responsible investment management with the launch of uh regnan global equity impact solutions you know which you know as 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 we know uh team is the the leader um and now uh, regnan operates as a standalone responsible investment business within the penda group uh, and Pendle is an Australian listed investment manager and owner of J.O. Hambro Capital Management. Um, and, and then again, just for, for context, you know, I can, I, I would like to also read a couple more things, you know, about uh, uh, Pendle and J.O. Hambro, but just for context for people, uh, J.O. Hambro manages about uh, 30 billion uh, pounds uh, across, you know, regions. And, uh, and uh, the website is, uh, oh, 
yes, J O H C M dot com. Uh, and Penda Group, as I added up looking at the website, manages currently $92.4 billion, I think. Uh, and it's been awarded the, the Fund Manager of the Year 2020 by Zenith Awards. And Penda Group is pendagroup.com. Um, let me stop there for a second. Uh, but anything that you would like to, to, uh, to share or add you know, before I keep uh, talking and, and praising the companies? Yeah, I mean, perhaps, perhaps just to give you some color and, and, and to dig into the sort of structure, as it were, um, if you'll allow me. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. The Regnant as a business itself started off in, in 1996 and um, actually started off not as a business, but as, a, as an academic think tank. Um, as, okay. you, as you rightly said, it was part of the, uh, the Monash University in Melbourne, um, originally called uh, the Monash Centre for Environmental Management. Um, it, it went through a few name changes um, it, before it became Regnan, um, uh, because of course, uh, you know, within a few years it had um, uh, evolved or, 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 or grown to not just focus on the environmental impacts on uh, companies and how those uh, environmental considerations could, uh, could help the creation of, or indeed, uh, you know, generate destruction of value within those companies. Uh, but also, of course, then it, it turned to focus on societal uh, effects as well, um, as well as governance um, and how governance also plays a part in, uh, uh, in, 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 in businesses and shaping their, uh, their valuations. Um, as you rightly say, it's, it's evolved into a business that was uh, focused on uh, engagement advisory and, and research um, and, and, and specifically really, you know, with a sound academic sort of backing in on the research side. I think that's what really differentiates uh, the Regnan team, um, you know, so much from other teams that we've, we've, uh, we've met in the past uh, is that, you know, they, they share this view, we share this collective view of, you know, as I've, I've sort of said in the um, earlier on is, it's about looking at system sustainability rather than siloed sustainability, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is why we sort of clicked so well um, when we met them. Um, so that's the Regnum business. It will continue to work as an advisor, um, not just to, of course, other asset owners, but also to, um, you know, institutions. Uh, I don't know whether you've come across, there's a great piece called, um, uh, published by the UNPRI called uh, Active Ownership uh, 2.0, which is, uh, which was co-authored by uh, Regnum's head of advisory, Sushila uh, Perez de Costa. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately what Regnum has tried to do historically was really influence the influencers. That's, that's where it's existed uh, in the past. And as you rightly say now, with the hiring of, of myself and, and the team that I worked with uh, on the previous fund that we managed uh, over at Hermes, um, to really build into a, um, you know, a pure uh, mission-driven impact and sustainable uh, investment manager over the years. Of course, we are owned um, by the Pendle Group, um, as is Jo Hambro, uh, and we will offer. Uh, sorry, we'll operate from the uh, the Jo Hambro offices here in in London. Um, but, but of course, it will be a global uh, business whereby you know anything that falls under specialist sustainable or impact will be branded Regnan. Whereas you know more broad ESG integration and active in integration strategies will be branded as. Uh, uh, either Joe Hambro or, or indeed Pendle Group. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I know you, I know the move. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I tried to learn as much as possible, but it's interesting. You know, I didn't know all the details and this, obviously I you know, started preparing more for our conversation. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, what I realized is how much I can relate in terms of, you know, and you know, I've been talking to you about what I wanted to build and my vision. Uh, so I'm going to kind of link the both because when I read, you know, some of the websites, I think I, I especially on the Penda uh, group website uh, about, you know, why you are different. It says, you know, aiming to be um, the best, not the biggest, right? Yes. Uh, that's yes. one of the points, you know, then um, that you, you know, work with proven fund managers, which again, you are the, know the, the real life example you know in terms of looking and attracting entrepreneurial approach and you know without the the lack of bureaucracy uh, you know to help uh, independently um, um, uh, to, to, to help the managers independently grow right and manage you know their their approaches and their strategies um, and then with this kind of the third point which is giving the full intellectual uh, freedom so uh, I think you know there is this no house view 
and trying to again work um, although you know there's the pen that there's the jail hambro regnan uh, and especially your team as i understand that now they're trying to give you that independence that um uh, right of thinking and action to you know drive you know your business within a very uh, a successful organization right so exactly and i think that that was really exciting to us as a proposition you know i think uh, you know as we we discussed with a, an industry or a subsection of the industry uh, that is evolving rapidly and more and more people are coming to look towards you know sustainable and impact investing um to people who are new to the fray it can be very easy to confuse you know for example esg integration with impact investing because ultimately you know there are similar drivers there are similar uh, similar considerations um and of course they are related in some ways but you know in, in in other ways they are very much distinct you know so i think to to the point you've made to have that freedom over the messaging of the brand to be part of of course the uh, you know the the inaugural asset management team and therefore have a stake in building and defining what the brand means uh, what regnan as an investment manager means uh, was definitely a huge uh, a huge draw to myself and the team because i think you know there there's a lot um about what we do um culturally that is you know that that goes beyond just the remit of of impact investing there is a lot mm -hmm. you know in terms of the way we invest in terms of the way we message to our customers the level of transparency we give our customers that is part of our core beliefs that, that we want to be part of the broader brand that is associated with us um you know it's not a it's not an ideological thing it's not a you know it's it, it's it's no judgment on on other strategies it's purely about communication you know and i think having this separation of brands allows you know esg integration is something which everyone needs to do you know the, i think yes. this is now we've got to a stage where this has become you know broad sort of mass market understanding that you know ESG integration is something you do to understand to analyze the investments that you're making and to understand the risks and perhaps even the opportunities that that uh, some of the businesses that you're uh, investing in are are, uh, are are presented with it's distinct to impact investing which is you know much more niche in terms of it looking to particularly drive positive outcomes against specific targets um uh, you know so i think uh, the, the having this this separation of brands is for us the best of both worlds because of course we still get you know access to some of the fantastic uh Joe Hambro teams that we'll sit in the same office with whenever we go back to the office yeah. that is in the, virtual, um, yeah. in the cloud office now exactly yeah. in the virtual office now and uh, you know and I spend a lot of time on the uh, uh on the on the on the on the on the on Microsoft Teams or Zoom with uh, some of the uh you know, fantastic uh, fund managers there in Joe Hambro and uh, you know I think culturally that culture that you've alluded to this this is nicely summarized with you know trying to be the best uh, not the biggest it's it's it you know Joe Hambro has not ever been an asset gathering uh, institution it's about you know really offering offering clients you know a distinct differentiated innovative proposition that responds to the needs that they have it's it, you know it's a solution in and of itself mm -hmm. um you know so i think that culture of joe hambro is something which is still very much uh, relevant and and was still hugely attractive to us uh, and it definitely is what if you like got us in the room uh, to have these conversations in the first place but of course then being um you know being able to 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 build upon that culture with the regnum brand for us was just you know it just played mm -hmm. into what we've always wanted to do yeah <coughs> sorry and uh this is really interesting because obviously you know i um was talking to you about you know some of my ideas before you moved to regnan and and actually kind of getting some nutrients you know brain nutrients and uh, from you you know from those conversations which i always tell people you know how important it is to talk to to your peers and to other people that are in the industry and and doing similar things because uh, uh, and and i feel like it's it's funny because i almost feel now that i i i'm replicating in my mind and in my vision so much of this right but i understand that you know so uh, i think i i mentioned to you before and uh, as i'm openly trying to share with everyone now you know we we aim to launch a multi-asset um uh, a management firm 
you know, that's what I would like to do to be able to focus on sustainable impact investing with this umbrella, um, you know, to help, you know, attract, you know, fund managers. And there are a lot of people like yourself, right, which are what I call sometimes, um, uh, and this is, you know, without contentions about it, right, they are sitting in the wrong houses, I call it, right? they're, they're sitting in companies that perhaps are not maximizing the potential and the value that some of these, you know, great managers and teams uh, have. Um, so I think that still there's a great opportunity there, you know, to do something like that. And that's what I'm trying to do. But the point that you also mentioned, which is, you know, uh, it helps me also to clarify to people that importance of, you know, when you're trying to do impact, is a lot about these foundations on, on one side, the research and, you know, your approaches, your framework. Uh, there is in the middle, and again, I'm not trying to simplify it too much in the middle obviously the action you know the process the selection process and we'll come to that in terms of you know how you you know your strategy and how you execute it uh, and then on 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 the other side there's this kind of engagement and change uh, that again we'll come back to the global equities specific you know which is how we want to start as well which effectively will be will become com competitors right uh i i ideally uh to, to ideally you know a very good competitor one day um, but uh, the fact that you need uh, this, uh, and, and we'll come back to the engagement depending on how big you are and how effective you can uh, be in terms of creating change. Um, uh, and lastly, the point that I think is evident, and I told you just at the beginning when we were prepping before starting, the importance you know, for other people wanting to do this. Uh, and, and you may have seen that I did a, a, an episode with Peter Woofley, which used to be the CEO of UBS Group. Uh, and we were talking about, you know, the concept, you know, how do you bring funds together? How do you bring fund managers together? Which they tend to be, you know, uh, you know, you're a very nice guy, Tim. I know you, but, uh, you know, they, they, you, you, my fund managers, you know, front office people, you know, they have a personality and it's hard sometimes to bring them together, right? Especially if you are... A, in this case, it's, it's a team, sometimes maybe easier, but if, if it is a whole firm that you're trying to bring on board uh, to try to bring them into one culture. So that's the clever part about um, uh, how uh, Pendle is approaching it, right? With the independence and, and allowing the teams to, to, um, to manage you know, themselves in a way. And I've learned the hard way, you know, when I used to be at RBS as well, you know, to manage it massive organization and to bring everyone within the same culture within different regions uh, within you know same region sometimes is you know it's such such hard work right yes and then finally um so sorry, sorry let me stop there for a second any any comments uh, no I, th I think you're right i think in terms of, of of culture that is um again one of the attractions of this model is that you have this this sort of shared central culture but then when it comes to the process when it comes to frameworks that you use to uh, to select your investments, um, you know, both within Regnan and and within the broader Pendle Group and and Joe Hambro, um, you know, each and every team is allowed to have their own views and their own way of doing things, um, you know, and I think that's why the brand separation is important because, um, you know, it, it it allows clients to know what they're getting on the tin, um, you know, before they even go into the details of how a particular fund is run. So I think that's. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, you know that that's absolutely true and and um, yeah it, it's it's uh, it's always going to be tricky when you have uh, you know one of, one of my colleagues uh, in, at Joe Hamber in fact likes to say that uh, the fund managers are like cats um, you know they all want to move in in different directions uh, rather than in a herd so I think it's it's uh, and it's it's very true fund managers uh, you know the, ultimately um, the way you create value is is by uh, you know is ultimately by either you know following uh, the way everyone is going or by being the first person um you know arriving where everyone else is going to eventually arrive um yeah. and i think i think in, in in some ways that is what impact investing tries to do uh you know from the consideration of of you know where the benchmarks are today and where they might be in 5 10 15 years time um yeah so i think we've always strived to do the latter yeah, that's a type yeah. of cat. Yeah, I'm just sorry for 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 people that will watch the video will see me smile. For people that are listening, they, you cannot see me smile. But I, I don't. I think you are you are, you are too young. Uh, uh, but I don't know, and many of the people actually that are listening to this may not know. But there is a cartoon that I used to watch when I was a kid called Top Cat. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you ever. 
I don't know if you've ever watched it or you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. But uh, the thing about Top Cat, right? He was so good at he was a, a good leader and he was maximizing all of the guys, right? So everyone was like doing the thing, but they were all getting together, right? So uh, it's interesting. I, I may use that analogy as a concept, you know, to try to build a company. It's funny, anyway. Funny, not funny, maybe. But um, so, and I, I, you mentioned about ESG, and and we'll come back to measurement, and we'll pick it up there. But it's interesting the whole point about ESG, and uh, you know, specifically also when companies, you know, you have to decide on the ESG specific ratings, etc., what it means. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that one uh, uh, bouncing for a second. Let me quickly jump to the next question. So, uh, and, and also you know, for, for, for the benefit of the listeners, you know, if you go to, to PENDAS website, you'll see that the capabilities are you know, quite something. So they have Australian equities, obviously, you know, from, from where they come from. They have global equities, bond income and defensive strategies, multi-asset and another fifth pillar, which is responsible investment. And you'll see all the different offerings there. Uh, which you know is is quite uh, substantial and varied. So, uh, since we're talking about cultures and everything, I thought it'd be very relevant to ask you very quickly about you know just may, maybe even you know briefly about just the team. You know, I know uh, I, I think I mentioned to you I know I have co connected with Maxime Lefloc, right? Uh, and then, but they also have a, a Mosin Ahmad and uh, Maxine. Uh, this is Maxine with an N. Uh, Will. Um, so. How how is it working? You know, since because basically the four of you came from Hermes all together, right? We did, yes. So uh, so the, the the four of us were the the four people that built the Hermes Impact Opportunities uh, strategy, um, uh, which we started building back in in 2016. Um, uh, you know, for 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 uh, for everything that we we have in 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 diversity, we lack in name diversity, as you rightly say, <laughs> as a Maxime yeah. uh, and a Maxime. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll confess, even though I've worked with them for for you know half my career now, I still get their names mixed up at times. Uh, but no, so the team is is uh, you know the band is all still very much together, which is. Um, uh, what have you been doing as well with the with the band? You know, since you joined, because you've been. Uh, oh, it's been helpful in this. So so busy, right? So we, we we used to talk a little bit, and then you just disappear. Yeah, so it's, it's been it's been absolutely crazy, um, and not least, of course, because of this change in working environment. You know, I've only actually been to the Joe Hamber offices three or four times uh, since since I since I started work there um, in the middle of last year. So, you know, it's 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 been bizarre because of the situation, but it's been so great to you know still have the same team members around me, um, as well as of course a bunch of new ones uh, in the sort of extended family. Um, you know, which are which just have made life so much easier, and, and and it's made the continuity so much easier because, of course, you know, this is very much a continuation of the same strategy that we started running, uh, you know, back in 2017. Um, you know, so it's been it's been hugely hugely important. Um, you know, the, the the team are something else. I mean, you know, I think I know everyone probably thinks they work with the best team in the world, but uh, you know, these guys are are. Um, you know, I mean, Maxime, I'm for example. Sure many people don't, Tim, so. I've been very lucky, perhaps, yeah. in my career, but, um, but uh, you know, I, I think they are they are great, and, and, and not just... What it is like, what it is like, uh, and sorry, I mean, this is great, There's so many questions that come to my mind, but what it is like to, you know, uh, basically m move, you know, a whole team from one firm to another? Um, well, we didn't move the whole team from one firm sure, to another. Yeah. We, were, we were, you know, we were hired all individually by uh, by Jerry Hambro, and uh, you know, of course, it was a happy coincidence when we realised that uh, we'd all ended up in the same place. Um, but you know, I think I, it's it was it was so um, you know so 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 great to be able to to continue the journey together because mm -hmm. the way we think is so much aligned. Um, the way we do. What we do uh, is different, I think, to, to to other sustainable investors in the marketplace. And uh, you know, I've I've used this term systems thinking, uh, you know, so many times now. And but it's you know, it's not just a catchphrase which I, I like to throw around. It's genuinely how we think. And um, uh, you know, Maxime Lefloc uh, is the uh, is the um, uh, is the undisputed king of the uh, the life cycle analysis, and uh, and can find a life cycle analysis for any product. Uh, or service on the market and uh you know i think that really uh it really you know um 
underlies what we do and how we do it uh, is the is the people and the diversity of experience that we have within this unique investment team. You know, it's we, you know, Mossin and myself perhaps have a more traditional stock picking fund management background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think that is of course hugely important because you know we are looking to make high conviction investment decisions on a on a long term basis. Um, however. You know, having Maxime and Maxine on board, uh, Maxine has a background in, in engagement uh, and stewardship. Um, again, that is a hugely important part of, as we've already discussed, of our of our day to day job. And you know, the, the four of them, uh, sorry, the three of them rather, um, you know, are, are, are a smart bunch, and uh, I won't include myself in that in that smart category. But uh, you know, the three of them really are a smart bunch, and and um, you know, I think I think one of the cultures within the investment team is this concept of constant improvement, you know, so the strategy, the process, the philosophy is identical to the one that we founded, you know, back in 20, well, we started building in 2016 and, and, and launched in 17. However, what's changed, what's evolving over time is the co constant improvement of each of the sub processes that is, that is involved to not just select the investments that we're making, uh, but of course, to, to assess uh, both pre and post investment, uh, you know, the decisions that we're making and, and, and we're trying to build and refine constantly this feedback loop whereby we can learn from our mistakes, we can put in place, uh, you know, new processes or, or sub processes all the time to try and make this better and, uh, and we're very transparent about that, you know, we wear, uh, you know, we, we wear both our successes and our failures on our sleeves and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're very open with clients and always happy to have a conversation with them about not just what we're doing right, but what we think we're not doing right and what we think we need to improve. And I think that's an important part of, um, you know, the, this the team culture that we've built over the years. Mm. And let me come back to the process in a second, but I wanted to just check with you any um, quick lessons about, uh, so two things, if, I, if that's okay. So one is, so what have you done in terms of uh, launches of you know products slash funds uh you know maybe next to that you know how much have you managed to attract in terms of you know funds um or inflows and uh, and any lessons uh, that you picked up from this very short period but very fast because you know as you as, as people will learn now you've been doing something that is it would have been almost impossible uh, without covid yeah, so I think in terms of in terms of the funds, we, so we've, we, that's a good point. I mean, you know, we, we've we've perversely we've we've been more productive than uh, than we probably would have been um, in uh, you know in, in a more traditional environment, and that's because you know what we've been doing is launching multiple funds, um, you know, concurrently. So we, it started off the strategy started with a a UK domiciled um, uh, fund which launched um, at the end of October, the twenty seventh of October. 2020, which was the sort of, you know, the start of the clock ticking, if you like, on, on the broader strategy. Uh, incidentally, I'm told it's only one of, of four funds uh, on the FSA's register that has been allowed to use the word impact in the name, which is interesting oh, because it tells you a little bit about the, the increasing focus of regulators, uh, you know, on, on, on using the correct terminology. And, and um, uh, it, perhaps that's something we can come back to if you want to dig into yes, later please. on. Yes, 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 we'll come back. Um, and what, so then after the, and it's funny, uh, by the way, I was going to say, so when we first talk and you say, oh, JP, um, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm moving and, uh, you know, I'm launching this product. I think that actually was just the one uh, that I knew about. And then as I was, you know, we were chatting on WhatsApp, you were saying, no, no, JP, I can't, you know, I'm launching another product. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think that that was the plan, you know, in my mind, yeah. you know, I was thinking, I never told you that, but uh, uh, I, I, so did it, did it, did the plan change? No, no, no. So they're all they're all the same strategy. So right. you know, the portfolio ultimately is the same. Um, you know, we've got an, an Australian fund which we launched in December, uh, and a, a European Dublin domicile fund uh, which we launched in in uh, January of this year. All of them are the same strategy, uh, same stocks, same companies. So it's okay. You know, it all falls into one um, strategy. And, Replicate, and uh, nice. You know, so from from that point of view, uh, and there will be new funds for, for for new domiciles just to. You know, to really try and democratize this as an as, as an investment category and, and you know broaden the access to uh, impact investing um you know probably what arguably is one of the most you know liquid and accessible formats mm -hmm. um and that, that was always the plan and nothing changed we launched uh, at the end of october with about 
uh, I think 10 million um, worth of, of uh, or 50 million dollars worth of seed money. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the few months that we've been up and running, we've had, we've had overwhelming um, uh, support for it from, uh, from, you know, a long list of, of some fantastic, uh, fantastic clients who, who, who have, you know, really responded well to the approach. And we've, I think as of today, managed to raise uh, over $210 million in these, uh, uh, in, in these few months that we've been up and running um, you know, with, with, as I said, with, with new funds to launch in the, in the process. But, um, you know, I, I think that was always the plan for us. I think, you know, what the lockdown gave us the opportunity to do was really think long and hard about, you know, what we could do, as I said, to sort of tweak and improve things. And, and um, you know, I think the, the, the biggest and most tangible improvement, obviously, is having access to this broader Regnan research team and the fantastic sustainability research that they, uh, as a team, um, can collaborate with us with, uh, or collaborate with us on rather, um, in order to go into much deeper depth uh, in understanding both the problems we're trying to allocate capital towards solving, and of course, which are the best solutions, um, you know, in terms of new systems mm. to allocate our capital towards. Um, but of course, you know, as I said to you in the in the previous uh, question, there there have been various tweaks in the sub processes that we've done. Uh, the team collectively read um, um, a, a great book uh, called the, the Checklist Manifesto uh, in the in the time that we had uh, between our jobs, and I think that influenced uh, a lot of the the improvements that were made to really try and make what is a very broad, extensive and qualitative process as repeatable and rigid as possible. Uh, and I think that's where we've spent a lot of our time really driving in some of the efficiency improvements and some of the process improvements um, you know, that, that we've been able to put into place uh, you know, in the time that we had uh, away from the desk. And I say away from the desk, we were in yeah, the same room yeah, yeah. <laughs> that I've been sad even for the last year or so. But, um, uh, so it's been it's been it's been productive in that sense. Uh, of course, we are looking forward to getting back towards a more social or sociable um, scenario and work with you know side by side with our new colleagues. Uh, but certainly, it has been helpful for us in terms of the busy uh, the busy uh, agenda that we've had and the some of the crazy hours that we've been working. You know, starting our day in Australia uh, and finishing our day. Oh, cool. You know. On, in the yeah. west of the world yes 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 I, I, yeah i actually i forgot about that a very very uh, important point so i've I, I have had a couple of uh relationships developed in australia and the 11 hour difference with sydney is is um you know a, yeah, what is the expression a killer <laughs> because they try to make it work it's either seven o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning or or sometime at night right um, so if we move then to that process and, and maybe talk about, you know, your portfolio, what you're selecting and maybe talk about an example, if that helps. Uh, I think I, I, I always remember that first conversation, uh, which I mentioned to you, we had once when you share the education company in Brazil, uh, which uh, I, interesting enough. And I, since then I share with all the, with everyone around uh, the world that I meet because it happens to be the biggest education company in the world, and most people don't know about it. Uh, and then also, I think it was a microfinance bank in India. Uh, but maybe, maybe can you share? And, and also, you said about the the checklist manifesto. Did you say that to make the help you make the process more rigid? Or I, I, I think I miss. I mean, maybe I miss her. But maybe so we, we bring the process, the selection for the portfolio, and an example that would be uh, amazing. Yeah, so I, I think just addressing your second point, you know, just to clarify that. Um, you know, so the process itself hasn't changed. Um, but what we've done is obviously we've got an eight stage investment process, or seven stage investment process, really. Um, and that ultimately, you know, each of those stages is, you know, has, has its own sort of complex you know, or list of sub processes, which we need to get through until we move on to the next. Uh, and what this book has, has, has I guess, you can say um, inspired us to do was to very much you know living off the experience of pilots right so pilots um you know, the, the, the idea of this checklist manifesto is, is built around um you know how pilots have made aviation uh, so much safer and given um uh, given pilots you know flying airplanes the tools to be able to react in different stressful high pressure situations yeah 
you know, and let's be honest, fund management isn't isn't a, it's 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 probably not as uh, you know serious in terms of the uh, uh, the emergencies that you face. But of course, you know the the, the situations can be similarly stressful, and uh, you know it, it is without doubt one of the most unstructured industries. Um, you know, in in terms of the the, the vast amounts of information that uh, fund managers are privy to uh, and need to process in order to be able to to, to make the right uh, and avoid making the wrong decisions. Mm. Um, so I think where this book was very helpful was in terms of putting structure around these unstructured processes that we've had you know, to come to the same outcomes, but in a more repetitive way. And, and by following a checklist, by trying to you know, make something perhaps not um, exhaustive, but at least having you know, a, a series of repetitive things that you need to check to be able to get the comfort that you need, for example, that you know when you're looking at a, a company's positive impacts, one of the things we also then spend a lot of time doing is, as, as we've kind of touched on already, is, is looking at their negative impacts. Um, you know, there are a large range of you know negative impacts that companies can have. It could be to do with their energy uses. It could be to do with how they treat their employees. It could do it could be to do with uh, their governance and how they run themselves. Um, to make that world, to make that analysis more structured, we've adopted, we've formally adopted, um, I don't know whether you've come across the Future Fit Foundation before, uh, but the Future yeah, Fit Foundation yeah. have, uh, uh, what, they run something they call the Future Fit Benchmark. Uh, and part of that is uh, um, uh, these, these break-even goals, um, you know, which allow uh, investors or companies to, to you know, to, to focus on addressing some you know, some, some common areas of where negative impacts might be prevalent, uh, you know, and having these 23 break-even goals, um, you know, to run through as part of this negative impact analysis makes what is a very open-ended task, something which is much easier to repeat again and again and again, and make sure we don't leave any stone unturned. Um, so that's what I, we I focused should, on. I should, I should say, uh, basically, I... If people want to learn more about uh, uh, Martin Ridge, the co-founder of uh, Future Fit Foundation, uh, we I think we had the record of the longest episode, uh, maybe still stand. Uh, it's number ten if, if people want to listen to it. Uh, but it's a yeah, fascinating man and fasc a fascinating concept and company. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm glad that you're using them. Yes, we're good good friends with Future Fit and, and Martins. Uh, although he and I are, are probably not on, on the best of speaking terms right now, because in the last podcast we did together, uh, he referred to me as middle aged. But that's that's for another yeah. day. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Martin's a great guy, and Future Fit is a is a fantastic institution, and it's a really good place, not just for investors to look, but for corporates to look. You know, I think what we love about the Future Fit uh, benchmark framework is that it's not just focused on outputs and you know static numeric outputs. It's focused on you know, the cause and effect relationships of what creates those outputs and what behaviors need to be changed in order to improve the outputs of, of the companies we're looking to assess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I digress. I don't Sorry, want to go yeah. too, of course, and, uh, but uh, you know, I would certainly encourage uh, investors and, and corporates alike to have a deeper look into that, uh, into that future for benchmark. So, really so, the seven, so the seven, is, so seven stages, right? That's the approach. Um, it's um, yes, it's a, it's a it's a broad yeah process of of broadly summarized into seven stages. Um, you know to to get the outcomes that we're ultimately looking for. Um, you know, which the, the one of them includes this, which is the future fit foundation approach in terms of looking at you know the way that you look at companies. Right? Exactly, and that, that is a sub process. So that is yes. that future fit benchmark is used as part of our impact assessment, which is the second stage of our investment process. Um, you know, so it, it is, it's exactly what I was alluding to with the, uh, the comments I made on checklists and having, you know, more of a rigid, repeatable sub a set of sub processes underneath each of those seven stages uh, to be able to make, you know, this, this very um, unstructured world as, as, uh, you know, as structured as we possibly can, okay. um, you know, without moving into quantitative ESG, which is a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the, the first part of the process comes down to how we identify companies. And that was something which we've, you know, which has always been the, the pinnacle of, of, you know, what makes this process different. This, 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 uh, this, this framework we've built over the years, uh, which we've called our, our SDG taxonomy, our, our sustainable development goal 
taxonomy is really the uh, you know the centerpiece, if you like, of uh, of how we you know I've talked a lot about systems and and systems change. Um, this taxonomy is basically what identifies or helps us identify, you know, what systems are we're going to be moving towards. Mm -hmm. uh, what the taxonomy is was the process of the team and I building a list of activities of economic activities. Um, you know, products and services that are being produced by companies to help achieve specific SDG targets. You know, so not, not, not the broad ranging goals, which are really, you know, open ended, but the actual 169 targets that underlie each of those 17 SDGs. Um, you know, and, and what we did with this taxonomy was basically over the years, we've been building up a list of solutions, a list of, um, you know, new systems that exist to do a better job uh, at whichever economic activity they're looking at uh, replacing. Um, and of course, this is what allows us not just to identify these activities and the companies that are selling these solutions, uh, but of course, to study them uh, and to understand perhaps where competing solutions might exist and, you know, which of these solutions does a better job at achieving whatever ultimate outcomes they're looking to achieve. Uh, it allows us to look at the growth potential for these solutions, how big the market could grow to over the course of the next five, 10 years. Um, you know, so it, re it really is, while it is, if you like, the input, the, the hopper to the investment process and where we get our investment ideas, it's so much more than that. It goes so much beyond just uh, generate an idea generation tools, because uh, ultimately it allows us to continuously monitor solutions, both in which we have an investment stake, but of course, solutions which we don't have a stake in, which we're not exposed to within the portfolio, which might one day change and improve and ultimately merit challenging something or perhaps replacing something in the portfolio um, you know, with, with, with a different stock or with a different company uh, okay. as a result of that, that change. Perfect. And then I was going to say, uh, to point people to go to your uh, tab, which is called Our Approach, where you mentioned, you know, your growing set of solutions. So these 150 solutions, you know, on the universe of these 2,200 listed companies. Uh, and this uh, kind of the aim to achieve positive impact with keeping companies on emission, engaging to reduce negative impacts and supporting management. And the, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share as well the portfolio themes, right? So you have wealth, health and well-being, energy transition, circular economy, future mobility, uh, and then food security, education, financial inclusion and water. Uh, for those that are interested. Uh, and in terms of the stages, just to double check, is that the, is part of the secret sauce? Is, does, is that available somewhere to look at or is going to be maybe coming in one of your reports later on? Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure if it's on the website, if I'm, if I'm completely honest with you. That, that's the broader in investment process. I mean, it's something that we will share, of course, with anyone who's, uh, uh, who's interested in, 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 in perhaps investing in the, uh, in the strategy. So it's, it's something absolutely we will, we will be Of course, to. of course. And... Um, and then you mentioned the, the life cycle uh, analysis, which I'm assuming is part potentially of, you know, w the first, if not one of those as well, right? Uh, just, I thought, just to link it. Uh, and, and I was just going to also say, I can completely relate about the checklist and the, 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 the planes, you know, because I, it's kind of how I live my life. Uh, you know, pick, pick, I picked it up, that example as well, from uh, a, a very wonderful man called Tony Robbins. You know, he talks a lot about it in terms of, you know, you set your aim and, and like, like planes, they never actually are going, flying towards the, the, the goal. They're always flying right or left. And then, you know, they just keep moving it and, and, and touching it you know, in a way, right? So that the plane keeps kind of somehow going into the direction, uh, which I used to like as well, the analogy with sailing, you know, we, you can, you're kind of never really going towards the goal. You're always going uh, one, one way or another. Uh, so I do love love that analogy, and we have never I have never spoken about it before. So thank thank you for sharing. Um, maybe maybe if we pick the kind of measuring impact, you know how you how you look at that. You mentioned you may, you mentioned the SDGs, which you know effectively um, is 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 the base of what you're doing. As as I as I hear you speak, uh, and perhaps I don't know if you can again mention I don't know an example of you know one of the companies that you are that you have selected uh, so that people can. Uh, so that people, investors, and also companies can understand your thinking. Uh, uh, we talked about the education company, for example. Um, I don't know if that one could be one of the examples that you can uh, use. 
sure. Um, so in terms of measurement broadly and, and generally speaking across the, 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 the portfolio, I mean, I think impact measurement is, it's probably not controversial to say that impact measurement is one of the biggest challenges that impact investors face. Uh, and I think that's broadly across all asset classes of impact investing. I think, you know, while some data in some, some uh, you know, some cross-sectional data, perhaps in terms of how companies operate, uh, is very easy to get hold of and it's data which is typically very reliable um, other areas uh, other data sets are much harder to get grasp and and and, and achieve at least in an accurate way um, particularly those that pertain to the specific impacts that are generated by the products and services sold by a company you know so i think from day one um in fact from day zero before before even um, you know running this strategy i think from you know, early 2016 when we were designing this strategy um, you know, it was it was it was instantly going to be we realized it was going to be one of our biggest challenges. You know, so I think our philosophy when it comes to impact measurement um, and it comes to understanding, of course, both the positive and the negative impacts of the companies we're investing in, to some extent, is slightly perhaps um, a slightly less mainstream. You know, I think mm. we've stayed away from you know i think there is a desire because of the way the financial services industry is to quantify everything you know people want to see you know at a touch of a button exactly if they invest you know a thousand pounds in the portfolio exactly what is that one thousand pounds going to give you uh, in terms of outputs in terms of measurable outputs and i think that is something we've always you know we've always been a slightly weary of until the data improves until uh, you know data gets better um, you know, because I think to, to be able to achieve that sort of at the fingertip data, um, while it is something which is without doubt, you know, a good thing and would be desirable to have right now, we don't have the, the, the you know, the, the, the quality of data that we need to achieve, you know, a quality output um, and a reliable output. So I think some of these, um, you know, some attempts to do this, if they're not done well, can lead to perhaps misleading numbers. Um, so I think when it comes to impact measurement, our philosophy has always been, first, be very explicit and transparent about how the particular solution that the company you are investing in is going to drive a positive impact against a particular SDG target. So we spend a lot of time, and you'll, you'll have seen our quarterly reports, um, uh, perhaps we, which I think should be available on the website. If not, please let me know and I'll send it one over. You know, we spend a lot of time explaining qualitatively what the link is between a particular solution, between a particular product and service, and how each unit sold of that product or service can generate an additional incremental uh, impact, which we then try to measure. Um, but you know, the, the the emphasis is on the the the, the proving and illustrating the relationship between the KPI we're trying to track and 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 uh, and, and 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 quantify over the the, uh, the years we're invested in that company, and you know the ultimate inputs, the ultimate you know, cause and effect relationship between uh, that that uh, that number. Um, so that's the broad sort of philosophy that we've had, you know, consistently over the years on impact measurements. And I think what that means is that we only rely on data that is given to us explicitly by the companies in which we are investing in, which means that not with not every metric, but most metrics are going to be idiosyncratic and specific to each of the 31 investments that we have uh, in the portfolio, um, you know, at, at present. Um, which makes perhaps it makes it harder to do cross uh, or in either inter -com, uh, portfolio comparisons or cross portfolio comparisons, perhaps. Uh, and we understand that. And, we, you know, we're trying to think of ways and devise new ways to help solve that problem. But we don't want it to be done at, uh, you know, at, at the compromise of, 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 you know, reliable, genuine data that it is coming straight from, you know, the horse's mouth, as it were, in, in terms of the companies that are producing um, these KPIs. Um, and how we do that, so, so to talk to you, to go more specific about a particular company, so you mentioned a Brazilian um, education uh, provider. Um, interestingly, um, I think the one that you're referring to is one which is no longer in the portfolios, but we are now invested in, in, in two, in fact, Brazilian education providers. 
uh, one of which is focused specifically on, on, uh, on healthcare education. Uh, there is a huge unmet need in terms of, uh, in terms of doctors uh, and medics more generally in Brazil, um, whereby uh, you know, if you compare the Brazilian average to the OECD average, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, just over one doctor per 1,000 inhabitants versus, you know, somewhere between four and five in, 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 in the OECD. Um, that number drops even further when you go out to the poorer regions of Brazil and you exclude, yeah. you know, of course, you know, more wealthy uh, cities like, like, like Sao Paulo or, or, or Rio. Mm -hmm. Um, which, goes you know, hand so that, hand, which goes hand in hand also with the with the infrastructure problem, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and I think you know that that has been you know part of this specific company's impact is 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 focused on you know helping broadening access, helping to broaden access to in this case medical education to help you know increase the number of doctors uh, not just within the, the the more wealthy centers of Brazil, uh, but perhaps with within some of the um, uh, some of the poorer regions. Um, the other company we have is a more general in university company, a company called Edux, um, uh, which is a company which again is is uh, uh, is is trying to broaden um, tertiary education, uh, but this time using online services. So they're a distance learning provider, one of the leading distance learning pr providers in the Brazilian uh, in, in Brazil. Um, and again, this is an important way of lowering the cost of edu of tertiary education for Brazilian students. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you look at the statistics, Brazil is a country whereby, uh, you know, I think it's less than 15% of 18 to 34 year olds or 18 to 36 year olds that have a tertiary uh, university education degree. Um, and again, part of the problem is that, you know, the numbers tend to be clustered around some of the wealthier areas um, of, uh, of the Brazilian um, uh, you know, of the Brazilian cities, exactly. So, so what distance learning does, you know, when you have a country whereby, yeah, sure, there's a public healthcare, sorry, there's a public uh, education system, but it, spaces are very limited. I think it's a couple of hundred thousand spaces that are made available every year. What they do with these distance learning courses, which are, you know, considerably cheaper than, uh, and offered at a considerably lower cost than, you know, you would pay to go to a brick and mortar university, what they can offer is the same quality of edu education, but delivered in a package which is much more affordable to uh, the students, um, you know, that will go through this distance learning business. Uh, you know, so it, it really is helping drive up education rates, tertiary education rates uh, in Brazil, which is, which is of course a huge, huge unmet need, uh, not just within the healthcare space, but more broadly within, uh, you know, a, a number of different industries. Um, and, and, and I think that is, you know, it, again, a key um, driver of social mobility. So what we do, you know, rather than just focus, of course, we can measure the number of students that go through these two institutions uh, and we can track over the years, the, 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 if you like, the, the, the you know, the, the cum cumulative number of students that have been granted a degree. Uh, and of course, we can look at statistics like the financial uplift that they get from, you know, the time before they entered the university uh, and then when they were placed in a, in a new job post-graduation. Um, however, what is more important is understanding this cause and effect relationship. And I think that's where we've spent a lot of our time qualitatively discussing, you know, and understanding how these two businesses can help satisfy these unmet needs. Uh, and that's always been part of the philosophy of the team and I, in, in an industry which wants to measure everything, in an industry which is so obsessed with counting beans, uh, I think, you know, our, our focus has been, you know, let's step back from just counting the numbers and, and just take a minute to think about why and how these companies and the products and services they sell can drive positive change, can drive better outcomes uh, against the targets that we're trying to measure. Brilliant. That's a, that's a, I, I, thank you for sharing that example. I think it's, um, that is the way that people can understand, again, you know, there is an education company that is listed. Uh, I, I don't know where, where are they listed. Um, one of them is they're both Brazilian-based companies. One is listed in Brazil. One is listed in the U.S. Uh, and what was the name of the first one, by the way? So Edox and the other one. And Afia, um, Afia. Uh, which is A F Y A. Um, okay. it's, a it's a Nasdaq listed company. And um, and then people can understand a little bit more about you know, how. Um, you know, through the power of you know education and also technology, 
in this case, which is the evidence. But I, you know, I'm 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 just assuming that obviously your process, you know, takes the 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 the, the, the fact the fact and the factor of technology to scale and reach, uh, and you know, increase uh, this impact. Um, uh, and it's interesting the social mobility. The only question that stays in my mind um, is the fact of so how then how can you measure kind of over a longer period of time of term of time, you know, that impact I had in that individual. Right. That is that is hard, if not impossible, right? Because absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and I think that that's why if you look at how we've how we how we break it out, uh, and I'm not sure again whether it's on the website, but I'm happy to share with you um mm -hmm. Uh, you know, some of the, the materials that we've looked at. And I know that we are publishing something to watch this space uh, that's focused on, on, on measurement. Um, you know, but, but uh, again, what we've tried to do is break down these impacts into, you know, the inputs that create these impacts, the, the outputs that you can count that are, you know, derived from these inputs mm -hmm. and the outcomes that pertain towards this ultimate impact. Because the actual impact itself is something which cannot be counted you know how do you express you know broader social uh, uh, mobility and and the impact that that has you can you can express social mobility itself of course mm -hmm. but the impact of that that social mobility on people's lives is very hard to articulate through uh, either one or a series of of metrics and kpis and i think you know that that's something we've always been focused on on emphasizing is that you know yes there is an, a, a huge need to be able to show accountability and show that it is these companies that are generating these impacts and of course then when it comes to mitigating these companies negative impacts that it is investors such as ourselves who are engaging to try and drive that uh, but ultimately you know the actual impact itself is something which is very hard to measure um mm -hmm. and something which you know it it, it, it transcends uh, you know just a, a simple kpi uh you know that can be counted over the years yes and uh, it's interesting because this is where the companies i was on a call uh, last night and uh you know the company was asking me okay so how can we you know better improve to show the, the impact of our product uh, and this is where the companies have the responsibility to help the fund manager you know by creating ways so in this case i'm just thinking out loud here timba you know as an education company in in both of these cases it, it, effectively, if they create a community where they can see basically the life, you know, almost uh, uh, over over the full life of a of a client, uh, of their clients, right? Yes. To see how their life has changed, that would be the only way for them to understand. Okay, how has your life life changed? And obviously, it's not just thanks to studying with them. There's you know, a million factors in, in impacting your life, right? Uh, and events and personal events, etc. But uh, I'm just thinking out loud in terms of, you know, that's the way as a company, uh, you know, delivering impact that I have to think about, you know, to create ways to, you know, see how I'm helping, you know, my clients, the people using my product. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just just that something that occurred to me and I'm not sure if they're doing it, but um, it's the community, the part of the community as well is always yes. important. Uh, they are actually, and interesting you say that because, so for example, Afia has, um, uh, it, you know, the majority of its business today is focused around the education side, but it, it doesn't stop when the, the, the doctor or the, the nurse graduates. It, it continues throughout as continued education throughout the career. Of course, you know, medicine is itself a field which is always evolving and uh, practices are improving and changing over time. Uh, as are, of course, the uh, the mm -hmm. treatments that are used. So uh, what they also have is a digital platform to help the decision making of doctors post graduation and uh, and and further on into their um, uh, into their careers. So yeah, absolutely, and I think that allows them to 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 really track the you know to go back to the point we made about life cycle assessments. You know, yeah. whether, it, whether it's a societal impact like this or whether it's an environmental impact, um, you know, what we're trying to count and consider is not just a very short cross section that occurs within the space of a calendar year, what we're trying to trace is, a, is an impact that occurs over a long period of time. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating because I, I, I happen to be thinking education, by the way, is kind of my top one SDG, my personal personal top one SDG, you know, from, from Ireland Partners is 17 uh, that we, you know, value immensely, but um, education is, is key. And now I always wonder in my case, you know, I, I, I tend to you know, share that, you know, I come from humble backgrounds, you know, in the North of Argentina, uh, but I don't think the people at Universidad de Buenos Aires know what happened to my life. 
the people at the Universidad Central in Chile, uh, Georgetown University, all the degrees I have, you know, I don't think they actually have any idea what's happened to my life, right? Uh, which, you know, because in the past, I don't think we were, we were not thinking that way, right? Yeah. The, the ripples and the effects and the opportunities that education creates. Yes. Um, so yes. anyway, and, and then as we move, as that, well, we're starting to try to, to wrap up uh, a team, but we'll have a couple more questions. Uh, and just before we move into um, looking into the future, uh, I have a, there's a really pivotal a event, I think, uh, this week, you know, which I I share. So we have the kind of SFDR kicking in, uh, you know, Article Nine uh, as, as 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 the one and the one specific point. Um, um, so I, I I mentioned to you I wrote and I've been promoting for people to 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 go and read. I wrote an article on on Forbes last week. I published it. Uh, so people can go to the website to find it. But as, uh, just to summarize, as the 10th of March, you know, was kind of an important day for sustainable impact investing, in my in my belief, um, uh, kind of or more commonly known and recognized to a lot of people as ESG. But as we explain today, it's not the same. Uh, I always talk about you know the spectrum, and I'm, I'm actually going to use your spectrum picture, by the way, on our website as well, which I think is the the, the impact management one. But uh, you know, we have sustainability, we have impact, we have ESG. So we have um, the kind of um, the first level of the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, uh, and we believe at, uh, that the, at ILM partners that this is kind of a great opportunity to become differentiated, you know, as leaders in this kind of fastest growing area of investment management. Um, and I, I personally believe it's a, a great opportunity right now, you know, to to use uh, you know teams, you know, like 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 teams. A teams are, are, are regnant and, and in our case, you know, I openly say, you know, the team that I put together and the, uh, the vision and the proposition uh, to develop uh, this platform as well. Um, but uh, the interesting point, you know, uh, and, and please go and read it, you know, is, is, you, you, you find, I try to make it not as technical, but it is technical. And so I try to make it people, you know, uh, simple for people and then also actionable. But, you know, in simple terms, the main objective is, you know, to combat greenwashing, to try to provide additional information, periodic reporting, uh, to allow, to measure, you know, the success uh, and potential comparison between products so that investors have that visibility. Um, in, in, again, it has implications at every level, investors, prospective investors, funds, management companies, board of directors, you know, communication, marketing. But again, just to simplify it, it's still self-classified. I don't know how you understand it. Uh, uh, there is no template, right? So it's basically, you know, we put our hand up and we say if we are or we are not. If you are 100% sustainable or ESG focused, you are within Article 9. Um, and the key consequences, if I had to summarize it, is around this reporting and the third party validation, right? Um, and then finally, before I ask you the question about all of this, is, you know, I have seen a couple of companies coming out last week saying, well, you know, our whole company is article nine and and i was mentioning to you team and, and i'm hopefully when i have him on on one of the episodes i was with philip sawati from miroba uh, they manage you know 20 billion uh in assets uh which actually doubled last year by the way in the last 12 months which is you know just to go uh, about you know what is happening but the whole all of their funds are article nine right so do you want to share any thoughts and views and how you perceive and this this as 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 as, as the good as the good news which I think they are and then you know, maybe what is happening today and the challenges going forward. Um, Very yeah. long question. Sorry. No, it's it, it's, a, it's an important question um, because of the objective of that regulation. Um, you know, as you as you've touched upon uh, with, with your question, you know, the objective is to to um, you know to to, to um, to end greenwash or to, to evade greenwash. So, you know, the question is how effective is it going to be in doing that? And perhaps even worse, are there going to be any unintended consequences? Are there going to be risks that it does, you know, disguises greenwash? Um, by the way, I'm not commenting on, on specific companies because yes. of course I don't know enough about what, what other companies do. Uh, I think Morova is a, a great uh, company by the way. And, and uh, yeah, we really like uh, um, what they publish and uh, we're big fans of theirs. Um, but but uh, sorry, you know, okay, sorry, just in case it's not Miro, but like I think uh, we had uh, other guests before um, uh, um, with Triodos, for example, as well. So I've I've seen a couple, you know, yes. uh, they are pretty sizable companies, and 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 hundred yeah. percent. I just it just caught my attention. Yeah, I, I think it's useful to the extent that it allows you to you know 
to explicitly, um, you know, with with a simple stamp, instantly express what you know where um, you sit along, or, or broadly where you sit along that spectrum of capital to some extent. I think, um, you know, but there is a problem in that it is ultimately self-certified, as you say. So there is a liability, uh, or there, you know, there could be a potential um, risk of, uh, you know, inconsistencies between. Uh, you know, different uh, different firms' certifications. Um, and also, you know, when you look at Article 9, which requires, you know, at, at the simplest level, uh, it, what, what defines an Article 9 fund is, is whether or not it has explicit sustainability goals within its, uh, within its uh, you know, within the prospectus, within the official mandate. Um, you know, that it, in itself is a broad thing. And, and for example, you know, an impact fund, well, of course, we are uh, Article 9 certified, or at least the, the, the Dublin fund is, you know, an impact fund is doing that in a very different way to perhaps a, uh, uh, you know, a, a lower materiality sustainability product, uh, which might, you know, invest in, for example, uh, you know, the big, uh, big tech companies and, uh, you know, much larger businesses, which have a, a much broader um, uh, business. Um, you know, so I think that it, it's a challenge for consistency uh, and for managing, you know, the expectations uh, of what it can achieve and, and the extent to which it can hopefully avoid these sort of unintended uh, consequences. Um, you know, I think uh, that's going to be the case with any uh, regulation mandated uh, program. I think, you know, the, the, the problem with regulation is that, uh, you know, it, it, it's trying to... Um, uh, particularly when it's trying to regulate an existing industry, uh, it's trying to you know balance the uh, the the different agendas that, uh, and and um, objectives that are in, already in play within the industry. So I think mm -hmm. the challenge is going to be how you manage um, you know the 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 uh, how you manage expectations of what it can achieve around you know trying to 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 you know be something that can be applied broadly. Um, you know, without being um, uh, without being something which is impossible to achieve or attain. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think time will tell how how useful it is um, in terms of actually going on uh, to, to to do what it wants to do. Uh, I think initiatives like the taxonomy are very good. The EU taxonomy is very good uh, in terms of um, you know trying to drive more data disclosure from companies. I think corporates really uh, are you know should be the focus of most of the regulation. Um, because you know their disclosures ultimately help fund managers make decisions and 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 provide the transparency that they need to give, as we were just discussing. However, even then, you know there could be unintended consequences, uh, perhaps in terms of uh, in terms of valuations and in terms of uh, you know the crowding of capital uh, into companies which might not be uh, you know having the most desirable uh, you know net impacts uh, when it, when you you know take into account. Uh, that some of these companies will be larger businesses and, and um, you know, broader ranging uh, institutions. So I think, you know, there are always going to be challenges associated with any sort of regulatory driven approach. Um, you know, so I think, I think I would always encourage any investor, whether they are new to responsible investing and the various different types of sustainable investment products, or whether they are veterans, I would always encourage them to build their structure their decision making around the spectrum of capital that you've just alluded to. Uh, and, you know, because that that is a great way of summarizing what the impact goals are and what the financial goals yeah. are um, and, and where the two interact and cross set, uh, you know, and, and, and intersect. So I think I think that is perhaps the starting point I would encourage, um, uh, you know, anyone to take um, and, and, and perhaps not to just rely on, on regulation uh, and, you know, whether a fund is Article 8 or Article 9, uh, you know, uh, as the only, um, you know, way of classifying different funds, because there is a lot of uh, nuance that goes into how particular investment mandates achieve what they're trying to achieve, you know, as they say, mm. the devil is in the detail, uh, mm. you know, so I think I, I think I'm that, gonna say something about that, yeah. I think perhaps they will help, you know, ultimately build, you know, investors and asset allocators, they will help them um, build a shortlist of uh, of funds that they want to look at, but uh, you know they won't certainly take away the, you know, the, the the huge amount of work that is going to be required to uh, you know to understand and assess all of these different funds and and how they do what they do differently. Yeah, yeah. I I, I make one last comment uh, before we move on uh, because the other part about the greenwashing, which I liked, you know, as you read the kind of the, 
lower level detail is this whole point about additional information, periodic reporting, you know, to allow measurement of success and potential comparison between products, right? Because uh, on the ESG point, and this is still very much ESG is the terminology used, right, all around. So the challenge with ESG, which I raised uh, last week again on another call I was in, uh, which is, I, I picked on, uh, there was an article, I don't know if you saw it, but there was an article uh, or by uh, Hargraves uh, Lansdowne uh, where they show the top five ESG uh, companies uh, in the FTSE 100. Um, so, and I love this because it gives you context, right? And I'm going to go, I'm going to mention it here, kind of from, from, from uh, uh, bottom to top, right? Number five, Coca-Cola, which, you know, as much as, you know, people may love it, it is sugar and plastic, uh, as a, as a, you know, externality, right? Uh, number four, Glencore, right? Which again, you know, we talked about HSBC, coal, right? Uh, number three, British American tobacco. Um, uh, number two is GSK. Number one is AstraZeneca. So uh, I don't think I have to say too much, you know, but to, to actually say, you know, if you're an ESG Article 9, you can still be investing in these uh, companies, which, you know, they all have, you know, goods and, and, and kind of positives and negatives or, you know, net impact. Uh, but it's interesting as well to just highlight what it means. I'd be very, I'd be very shocked and very hopeful that you don't see Article Nine funds investing in, you know, tobacco companies or, um, you know, companies that 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 clearly are, are net negative impact businesses. Hmm. Um, you know, but I, I, I think it, what you say it it underlines the complexity of this industry. Yeah. You know, we want to classify things as good and bad. You know, what is Glencore? Is Glencore good or bad? Yeah, sure, it has a, a lot of its business is negative, but of course, you know, we need commodities like copper. Yeah. To, yeah. to, to build electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm not saying that mining copper is, is the best solution. There are you know, plenty of ways to recycle copper, by the way. Um, but th that's beside the point. I think ultimately, you know, what, what is the point I'm trying to make is that having a, a very simple output-driven process to, to assessing businesses and the environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities that those businesses are, are, are facing, you know, Yes, we use all of these these scoring systems as part a very small part of our process to you know because they do raise questions. They don't give you answers; they raise questions. But there's a limitation. There's a natural limitation to what data can give you, um, and and there are plenty of ways, uh, as with any data test, to uh, you know if you're providing the uh, the data uh, to cheat. Uh, you know, and to perhaps give the wrong data. I'm not, by the way, accusing any companies of doing that, but uh, mm. you know, I, I think it is part of the challenge that that investors face when they move, you know, as they move towards uh, sustainable businesses. And I think fund managers in particular, you know, go through this journey whereby, you know, first they're exposed to, the, you know, ESG and and this understanding of what ESG tools can help you achieve. And and you quickly then learn the outcome of what uh, the, these tools can can achieve. Uh, and, and the limitation, sorry, of what these tools uh, can achieve. And so I, you know, I think when it comes to Article 9 funds, in, in long story short, I would hope to see that, you know, all Article 9 businesses are taking a much more um, nuanced and, and, uh, and thoughtful approach to, to um, classifying which companies they will ultimately invest and allocate their capital towards and which they won't. Uh, and I'm not saying any of those businesses should or shouldn't be in an Article 9 fund. Um, uh, you know, I think ultimately businesses change and, uh, you know, uh, businesses can reinvent themselves, which is something that, that needs to be reminded. Uh, you know, we, we, we have uh, some great examples in our portfolio of companies that have transitioned. Um, you know, in, 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 you know, from perhaps you know, industries that have been, you know, extractive industries and negative industries in the past towards, you know, positive areas like renewables and uh, renew renewable energies. But ultimately, um, it's much more complicated and much more qualitative than, you know, just a simple uh, scoring system can ever help you achieve. Um, and I think that's why what investors really need to do to do this well uh, is find some really smart people like uh, the, 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 the smart people that I've been fortunate to work with yeah. uh, in my career and still do in the team today yeah. to, to help them take these decisions in a much more holistic way. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 uh, just to close this, I was, you actually went straight to where I was going to go, which is, um, yeah, the, uh, and again, for if it's not clear, the benefit of this conversation and what I'm saying is exactly trying to show 
uh, to that investment manager that's going through the process, this perspective understanding uh, and, 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 you know, within the spectrum and within the complexities. So I hope that, you know, people uh, understand and appreciate. And I think that it's been fantastic to talk about it this way. I, I believe, Tim, uh, I hope you agree. Um, and then the other point I was going to mention is, you know, that's where the intellectual property created by a team like yours uh, and, and what we're trying to create the island partners is the same. So that that is where the magic happens and that's how you can really create the difference and, and create impact. Yes. And Absolutely. I'd yeah. say anyone can replicate a process and, and a framework, but ultimately, you know, this has to come from the people that are running these strategies yeah. uh, and a desire to do something for the right reasons and with the right intentions. Intentionality is what makes impact investing. Yeah. You know, yeah. sort of and, and, and on that point, intentionality, what, I, what I'm picking up, as a, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic and I like, you know, looking at the positives on things. So the, what I realize in these companies claiming or self-classifying you know, 100% Article 9, I, I what I took away from the conversation last night was it's a commitment. You know, the fact that you're putting your hand up and you're self-classifying, you know, 20 billion in this case specifically, uh, is such a huge commitment to, you know, creating reporting, uh, you know, engaging with third-party companies to really, you know, people don't appreciate the, the, how how hard it is to do this, right? Uh, so I, I do I do appreciate that, you know, commitment to trying to move towards towards that, right, which is going to be a process, as we know. Um, so talking about just the last uh, two or so questions, three maybe, uh, about the future. Right? So where do you see then as all of this happening, you know, and there's some obvious opportunities and trends that we talked about. Uh, and then the other point, which I always ask about, you know, how do we scale these funds, you know? So you start the very, with 15, went to 210. Um, you know, what, what, what is that the biggest opportunities and how can we scale, how can we, you know, uh, transition more capital into sustainable impact, impact investing, which is, you know, uh, uh, my mission and uh, my company's mission? Um, so I think, I think, you know, obviously the capital has responded very well over the last 12, 18 months to yeah. performance. And we're always, uh, you know, I think uh, as more and more investors have learned, um, you know, how, impact or sustainable funds uh, or ESG funds, uh, you know, try to, to, to do what they do to generate performance and to improve their risk adjusted returns. I think that in and of itself um, is naturally going to broaden the industry, you know, historically impact investing and, and still does you know, have have areas which are, you know, where returns are deprioritized, where returns, uh, lower returns are tolerated, or, or indeed, um, you know, higher risk is tolerated. Um, that is changing today with more and more uh, impact funds uh, coming to market that are aiming to beat the markets and uh, to beat their peer groups, um, you know, as well as delivering a positive impact. Uh, and by definition, that will just increase the size uh, of the market uh, as it happens. And I think that's, that's uh, definitely a positive thing. I think education is so key. Education, uh, you know, in this industry, you know, being able to help investors that are new to sustainable impact investing and the broader responsible investment space, being able to help them understand and decipher this alphabet soup of, uh, of terminology um, is, is key because it allows them to quickly or more quickly align you know, their own objectives with the, the products that are available to them on the market. Uh, you know, so I think further education and refinement of, of um, you know, the terminology we use is key. Uh, and I would really hope and encourage, you know, some of the fund managers that are perhaps newer to the game, uh, you know, to, to try and be vigilant and, 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 and careful with how they label their products, uh, not just from a regulatory point of view, but also from a naming convention point of view, uh, because it, of course, you know, it makes a big difference in helping um, uh, the broader understanding, uh, you know, to people who are just learning about this space, um, you know, as we speak. Um, and I think other than that, you know, it's, it's just going to be, um, you know, product innovation, as we've always seen in the financial services space. Uh, that's what financial services has done so well. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence, for example, that, you know, the growth of impact investing has, um, you know, somewhat gone hand in hand with, uh, uh, the growth of of, uh, of passive investing, and I say that because, of course, impact investing is something that is is not the space of passive investment management. Of course, there are some uh, incorrectly named, perhaps passive uh, impact investing vehicles, but I would argue that true impact investing 
could only ever be done by an active manager who, who actively engage, uh, engages with the businesses uh, that, that, that he or she is looking to invest or direct capital towards. Uh, you know, so I think, I, I, I think there are some, um, uh, you know, there, there'll be some innovative products that come to the market over the uh, next few years, um, which is only going to help expand the addressable market uh, of the broader responsible investment space. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier on when we were chatting, uh, you know, we're soon launching a, a water and waste product uh, <laughs> that is focused on a specific theme, the theme of water and waste uh, that was uh, run by a, a very smart team uh, who's coming to join us um, in, in over the next few months. Um, you know, and, and I think you will see more thematic innovations happen, um, you know, which are able to perhaps take a more stock picking approach to a more, uh, a more um, uh, you know, a more, a more selective approach, perhaps to areas which have become very, uh, very popular in the more broad uh, thematic sustainable um, ETF space in the more passive space. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think I think this is uh, somewhere where again, you'll see active managers uh, innovating in, in the future. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, it's it's an exciting place to be, and and um, you know, I, th I I think the industry will just grow as it responds to the problems and trying to solve the problems that our clients um, are facing. Yes, thank you, thank you, Tim. And uh, I was gonna say, so so product innovation could mean a lot of things, right? Uh, but when I, when I hear you speak, some of the things that come to my mind are, you know, kind of the, the, it, it, it's a combination of you know the tools that you use the processes the sub processes which you know team alluded to uh, i think the stages uh, and then like you mentioned the themes right so water and waste is something that um, I, I think um something that we need to focus on we have an upcoming uh, uh, episode on that so um uh, keep keep your eyes uh um open on this one and your ears in this case. Um, so just to finish off, uh, uh, Tim, I just wanted to ask you uh, maybe one, let me do maybe like a, 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 a one in three again, which, you know, I've been told many times not to do, but just for the, for the benefit of, 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 uh, of uh, your time as well, um, which is um, how did you kind of end up doing this and kind of, and why you're doing it? That's kind of you know the personal part you know about team and you know, I remember wow. you, you I remember I I I asked you once you study in Malta you know you ended up doing this I know that we can do a whole a a a, a whole um, episode just on you. Uh, no, I, I would I would not like that, but uh, yeah, you are you I, are delving into something which I could give a long answer on, and I'm going to yeah. try to, to resist doing that because no, uh, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's okay, but it's just kind of the the why it could be you know very simple, right? So I know that uh, you are a father, you know. Um, um, you know, and and then the other thing as well, which is the name of the podcast, I always ask, you know, is impact leaders, you know, what makes an impact leader, you know, and in a way, I love it that you are leading, you know, this team and you are creating new things because you are leading the way with actions, which brings me to the next, the last question, which I'm going to ask you is about, you know, what is your call to action to listeners, right? So, yeah, why, why, why are you doing it? You know, what makes an impact leader and what would be your call to action for, for people listening? Right. So I've got uh, well, three, four minutes left. So I'll, I'll try and summarize this answer as quickly as possible. So the why is, is perhaps uh, an easy question to, to answer, uh, not so much to summarize, but uh, you know, what got me, uh, what, what it, the, the sort of first domino to fall in my life happened uh, back in Malta when I was in school uh, at, at a very, very early stage. I had a, a very inspirational teacher who was uh, an active environmentalist. She was, uh, um, apart from being our environmental science teacher, was also um, a, a part of Greenpeace Malta. Um, sadly, she, she, she passed away from cancer um, a few years after I left school. Um, but she, was a, she had a huge what influence her on... Uh, her name was Maggie. Maggie Borch uh, was her name. Uh, and she had a big, big influence on, um, on uh, lots of students' lives, not just my own, because uh, she was an, just an inspirational person and she knew how to get the best out of people. Uh, and to, to really, you know, give confidence to, uh, to, to, to all of her students. But I think why she was so influential on me, I used to have, as much as we, we, we got on together, we used to have long debates um, about the role of capitalism and the role of, of the, the, the markets and, and the economy uh, in making the world a better place. And I think, you know, I always had this innate belief that if you were going to drive change, you couldn't enforce change from above. You had to get a broad buy-in from ultimately, you know, the economy and 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 the businesses and and uh, 
uh, you know, the institutions that drive the, um, our economies. And I think that's why uh, I, you know, when, when I got given the chance to be part of a team and build an impact product uh, back in 2016, um, I jumped at the opportunity. And I think, you know, the rest, as they say, is, is, is history. In the making, yeah. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, hopefully. Um, in terms of what makes an impact leader, uh, gosh, I wish I had time to think about that more. But, I, you know, I think uh, if you had to force me into a quick answer, I'd say the, the one word that comes to mind is innovation. Okay. Innovation is so important, you know, um, you know, we, 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 we're so obsessed with, with like we've been talking about measuring things and classifying everything um you know and 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 you know trying to do things with best practice which is absolutely important i don't want to contradict myself however i think innovation is key i think i think you know businesses good companies exist to solve problems we've called our fund the impact solutions fund because not just we invest because we invest in companies that are solving problems but also because we see ourselves as a solution we see ourselves for a solution which isn't really broadly available on the market uh, for our for our clients that have this problem they need to solve in terms of you know how can we direct our capital towards the most mission driven uh, businesses that are trying to solve some big problems in in the world but at the same time not compromise on financial returns um, you know so I, I'd say you know, the ultimately leaders in any industry uh, are those that know how to innovate and know how to, you know, understand the rules and why they're there, but sometimes they need to perhaps rewrite the rules and, and, mm. and change things for the better. Nice, nice. In yeah, terms yeah. of my call to action, um, you know, I think the, the one thing I would really like to see um, and perhaps the, the, the call to action I would always make, uh, you know, and I have made perhaps in m many a times to in, in different forums is that don't just buy in. You know, this is an area to, you know, which is it leaves it susceptible, as we discussed, to greenwashing. Uh, you know, everyone, whether it's a fund manager or a company, a corporate, anyone can stick a picture of a wind turbine or, a, uh, you know, or a, or a, or a sustainable agricultural uh, business in their in their uh, in, in their um, uh, documentation, uh, and of course we'll find those in our documentation as well. Absolutely, uh, you know what I would always say. My call to action would be: look beyond the marketing department, look beyond the imaging, really challenge investors to tell you what they want to achieve and tell you how they intend to achieve it. You know and you can't do anything better than that. Yes, there's always going to be this alphabet soup uh, of letters that we use to classify things, but ultimately, um, you know, go beyond the uh, the uh, the wind turbines. Nice, nice. Thank you. Educate yourself and get deeper. You know. So exactly. thank you so much. How thank you so so much. How how can people get in touch with you, uh, Tim? Um, I think you can send an email via the website okay, uh, that you mentioned earlier on. Perfect. Okay. Thank Thanks you so, so much. I really appreciate it and uh, have a, a wonderful rest of day and week, uh, team. Uh, it is bye for now and until our next episode of Impact Leaders. Uh, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Impact Leaders. Impact Leaders is brought to you by ILA and partners. Please connect with us to work together in the transition of capital into sustainable and impact investing.